Uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Erik Bünger and um, I curated this festival, The Curse of Smooth Operations, together with Florian Wüst. And um, tonight we're going to bring in Why Theory. Uh, Why Theory is a philosophy podcast running every two weeks since 2017. And um, I stumbled upon this podcast really early on, already from the very start. And since then I have become an addict of this podcast. And one thing that uh, attracted me so much to this podcast was the, f the focus on contradiction. That uh, contradiction is no obstacle to thought, but the very thing that uh, opens up thought and makes it um, possible to really philosophize. And this is, of course, something that really stands at the uh, heart of the curse of smooth operations as well. The idea that um, the most dissatisfying technology is the one that works is precisely such a contradiction. Uh, and it's a contradiction that is not there then for its own sake, but precisely for us to, to be able to truly think. Uh, therefore, we decided to invite Todd McGowan and Ryan Engley of Y Theory to put their teeth into this contradiction, into this particular figure of thought. Uh, Todd McGowan teaches theory and film at the University of Vermont in the United States. He is the author of Enjoyment, Right and Left, The Racist Fantasy, Emancipation After Hegel, Capitalism and Desire, Only a Joke Can Save Us, and other works. He is the editor of the Film Theory in Practice series at Bloomsbury, and he is the co-editor of the Diaresis series at the Nor Northwestern U University Press. Ryan Engley is an assistant professor of media studies at Pomona College in the United States. His work has appeared or will appear in New, Re New Review of Film and Television, Comparative Literature and Culture, Continental Thought and Theory, and the International Journal of Shishek Studies. So, uh, Todd and Ryan, hit it. Ah, hello. <laughs> hello, Impact Festival. We're so happy to be here. Eric, thank you so much for the very generous uh, introduction. And I want to thank people behind the, the scenes. Now, uh, in the sound, uh, Manon, who is uh, managing with arcane uh, technology to maintain our uh, connection and make sure that everything works possibly. And then uh, Saskia for wrangling the two of us. Uh, this is wonderful. We're happy to be here. I wish we could be there in person, but this is uh, going to be a, I think a wonderful substitute. And hopefully there will be some technological stumbles along the way, because I think that fits with the conference theme. Todd, how you doing, buddy? That's how I start this. Normally. I'm doing good, Ryan. Good to see you. I'm okay. Good to see you. Yeah, we don't normally see each other when we do this for a little peek behind the curtain. We typically do this over the phone and we don't look at each other. Uh, which is how we both like our relationship. Uh, so to be a little bit more uh, behind the curtain about um, how we're going to uh, manage this is uh, we're speaking to multiple audiences at, the, uh, at once. So we're obviously speaking to the audience that is listening to me live uh, right now or roughly contemporaneous with the moment in which I'm speaking these words. And you've been in a, a festival, a, a conference setting, thinking about the topic, the focal theme for five days. And our audience, this would be the first introduction for them into this. And for the audience here, some of the things that we normally talk about in the podcast may be like new and familiar. So we're going to be navigating uh, this uh, at the same time. But we're, we're going to restate what Eric so eloquently uh, uh, started. The focal theme, of course, is that the most dissatisfying technology is the one that works. And we're going to immediately disrupt it. Todd, if I said to you that the basic idea of Hegelian dialectics uh, is that every smooth operation breaks down and that it is at best a, a smooth operation is a seeming semblance. What would you say to that? I think that's absolutely right. I think that it, it, you could almost trace Hegel's entire philosophical musings as an attempt to show how something seems like it's a smooth operation. And we can even trace 
the operation as it goes and, and appears to be going smoothly. And then we run into, Eric used the word contradiction, we run into a contradiction. So the smooth operation is always reveals itself as uh, something that there's a, there's a non-smoothness in it that makes it appealing to us. And I think that's the, it's an interesting point. I think this, this festival brings together two thinkers that we like to also bring together, Hegel and psychoanalysis or Freud and Freud and Lacan, right? Like that, that, that for, for the idea of psychoanalysis is that it's the disruption within a line of thinking or the disruption in a person, an object that makes it desirable. So if something truly is a smooth operation, it wouldn't be desirable at all. But I think Hegel's idea would be, wait a minute, there's not a smooth operation anywhere. Like whatever seems like it's a smooth operation is always going to go awry if you trace out its logic far enough. Mm. I think that's great. And what I want to add to this is like, of course, like there's the, the great, uh, like in the um, video for people who are there and for people looking at this as a video, you, the, um, you know, the intro had a nice list of like moments of like where technology uh, fails. And like, we'll just add to this, like when the ATM does not recognize your pin and that's like an infuriating experience or your iPhone doesn't recognize your face and you're like, how the hell is this happening? Um, so, and yet, I, because I and agree, of course, with what uh, Todd is laying out there. That like, there, like from the Hegelian perspective, there's not, there simply wouldn't be a smooth operation. It would, it would all be seeming. It would be semblance. So I use that word, and yet, it does feel like there is. Okay, like it does feel like there are smooth operations out there, and so that I think is what we want to get into. And I have some answers uh, or, or, or some terms and ideas that I want to get into uh, with this, but um, I, where, how does that hit you? Because Todd, there are like, um, I gave you this example when we were uh, prepping for this. Um, this isn't technologically an, uh, an example, but when I taught at the University of Rhode Island, uh, it took me a few years to find out that I was often teaching in a building that had been completely rebuilt with prison labor. And there's just no way to know that there was there was no way to know there's no plaque there was like there was no shame about nobody like nobody talked it was only like someone had to have been there long enough to have known that that happened and then they had to have mentioned that to me and that was the only way I knew that so it, it sort of introduces this idea like that's a smooth operation is the one that you don't see happening at all and there you know there's there's no uh, smoother operator nay smoother criminal uh, than capital itself so where 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 does that fit in with what we're trying to trace out, Todd? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great example, actually. And I think the the example I want to use is really closely related to that because you mentioned the phone and I think the, or the facial recognition of the phone, but the, the what we don't see in the phone is the thing that makes it into <laughs> an object in the first place. And yeah. so even though we can get frustrated by certain aspects of the phone, like the failure of the facial recognition, what we don't see, and this is the point I think you're getting at, is we don't see the, the, the for instance, the, the, the kids in the Congo going down into mines to dig up the cobalt for the phone's battery, right? So that what we're, what we're not seeing, and I think this concept is really important for psychoanalysis, is really important for capitalism, for understanding capitalism, especially today, maybe always, is the concept of fetishistic disavowal. And what that means is that you, you are you're attached to a certain fetish, which is the, the technological device itself. And what you miss is the lack that's within the, 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 the fetish or the device or the object. So, so in this case, you miss the way the labor, the, the, for, I just almost said slavery, the prison labor that mm. went into constructing the building in Rhode Island or the, the child labor that goes into constructing the iPhone. You don't see that, that lack is, is missing because you're you're drawn, you're taken by the fetish of this smooth operation. So I think in a certain way, the ideal of the smooth operation is the fetish that we're that that, that obscures the lack that makes that operation possible. Yeah, I think you know this. This is one of those things that for me, like the why um, when it, you know Eric contacted us for this, I think we were both into the idea is that like in our fields, um, I'm more broadly in in, in media studies. Uh, and you in film studies, but of course, talk writing about capital, like the idea of the uh, the idea of the smooth operation, the focal theme of the, the whole festival is very, very appealing. And it gave me uh, 
occasion to pause, like, well, why doesn't my field say this exactly? And I think what's happened, especially in media studies, is there is uh, a, a getting wrapped up in the object itself and not thinking about things like desire and lack and certainly the, the psyche. So I just want to put uh, a, a, a concept that I think is a nice example of smooth operation and then why as a concept in the field in which it is employed, it does not come to the conclusions that like, you know, we're trying to draw out and what the uh, conversations of the festival have been having for all, all week. And so the idea is flow, um, uh, Raymond Williams. And there, there's a sort of a story for how he gets the idea. He's, he, um, I think it goes like this. He, he has a, he's running a fever. He's in a Miami hotel room and he's running a fever and he's watching television and he realizes for the first time it all flow it, it all flows together it all like it, it's it's but but it but it shouldn't because it's a, there's like if you watch one if you watch one channel of especially american television like uh, from the the beginning of the day to the end of the day it's uh, soap operas daytime talk shows news sitcoms drama cop drama all intercut with commercials and the commercials are all different and they're all but it all it all works it all seems to it all seems to be a smooth operation. It all seems to flow together. This was his idea, and the, the his idea is how does television overcome its own extreme fragmentation? That's flow, and the a, a lot of the inqu inquiry into it, a lot of it worth well worth reading uh, in television studies is very very object focused. How does an object accomplish this? How does the object television? How does programming? How does formatting accomplish this? And what's not in the the literature, uh, at least so far as I've read, um, is the idea that it flow is on the side of the subject. It's not on the side of the object, and that I think is what what we're we're getting at. Like like, and this is what you're getting at with fetishistic disavowal is we make it, we smooth it out. Like like if you really thought about TV the way Raymond Williams was thinking about it when he's having a fever, like it is. It, like film doesn't work that way. You wouldn't go to a theater and expect to to see on the screen like a live footage of a monster truck rally or news or and then you know again a sporting event or sick. You were expecting to see film like like what like and then on a on a, a you know on your own iPhone or a computer screen like you're choosing what appears on it. So that's another way of like overcoming that the, that fragmentary experience. Um, so everybody's over invested on the uh, on the object. What do you think about that? Being over invested in the object. Do you think that's something that's uh, at work here in, in not seeing how the psyche is involved? Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. And I think it's really nice that when you said the word flow, your signal blur stopped up a little bit. So, yes. so that was absolutely perfect. That's what I want. It. Um, <laughs> I think that's right. I think that 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 the that if you think about it in terms of disavowal, then you see the activity of subject, the subject at work. And it's not just the object that's creating this, uh, the, the, the smooth operation, right? Like it, it, there would never be even the illusion of the smooth operation if it weren't for the activity of, sub, of the subject disavowing the lack. But what, what I find interesting is that if it did, if there wasn't the, error or the screw up, then there wouldn't be anything desirable in the technological device at all. And so I think mm. it's interesting that our, you know, you talked about the frustration of the, like, the, and I think frustration is the right word. Like we, no one, no one experiences frustration when their technological device works. I find mm. that kind of interesting, right? Like no one, yeah. even though the whole premise of this this gathering is that there's something ultimately dissatisfying about things working. All of us can think about the times, like one of my favorites is when I call, uh, try to get a person on the phone and I, all I can get is they're like, press this button, <laughs> but they're, none of the options are the ones I want because none of them will get me to the thing that I want. So that's frustration with the technology, but there, there, we don't have the same corresponding feeling to the thing working. And I think, you know, working smoothly, right? So, I think what would be the word, what would correspond to that? I think so. Fr it's not frustration. I think it's something like ennui, right? Like it's something mm. like boredom, tedium, the opposite of desire. So it's it's only the thing that that monkeys up the works that gets our desire engaged. And I think that's why. But at the same time, that's what we disavow. So I think there's an interesting kind of mm -hmm. relationship between that. All on the side of the subject, like you're saying. Mm. 
uh, I think there's this impulse to like attribute it to the object itself. Like the object isn't working. The, the object is smooth operate, but no, it's actually on the side of our subjectivity. Mm. So why do we, why, why do we want that Todd? You know, I think this is what we're like, 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 why does it, why does it appear? Why does it appear this way? Because that's, that's the thing. Like, like, like it, it should be, I think it should be um, obvious uh, logically. Like, I think you said this to me that the, the next time, uh, the next time that you, you have an experience with a technology that works, it'll be the first time. Like, so, so why, so why, so, um, why is it that the, why is it that the, the failure looms so large? Why is it, like, I think we've talked about this on the show before that, like, a, like, you'll see, um, like, I, like right now with, uh, Elon Musk taking over Twitter is that a lot of people think they're criticizing the medium or they're criticizing Musk or they're criticizing capitalism, but what they're really asking for is a better master. They wish there was a better master who owned Twitter. And uh, so, why, why, what, what would be like our 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 in engagement? Like, why does that? Uh, why, why why does it appear this way? Why why is why do why should the semblance exist at all? Why why shouldn't uh, why should it loom so large and not the break? I guess would be my question. Yeah, I think it's a great question, but isn't it? Doesn't it? I wonder what you think about this. Doesn't it come down to the okay. difference between consciousness and the unconscious? Right, like. Like unconsciously, we're drawn to the failure, the interruption. What did you call it? The break, the rupture, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think unconsciously we're drawn to that, but then consciously we, we, our whole consciousness is oriented around the idea of success. Like we want the thing, we it, we we will that the thing works. We desire mm -hmm. that it doesn't, and I think that to me that contrast mm -hmm. is pretty interesting that that if you think about the way the role that the unconscious plays in seeking out these disruptions because if i mean this is true like if you if you think about anything if it, if you're completely successful at it it becomes utterly tedious right so that's why unconsciously we're all the time subverting the smooth operation or seeking something that subverts the smooth operation but i think that that can the problem is once you enter it into consciousness, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I, someone was just, someone just sent me a, a minister actually sent me an essay that he wrote <laughs> about, about ethics and psychoanalysis and Hegel and, and it was really good. And, and, and he said, there's this game called reverse chess where the point is okay. to lose your pieces as like you want to be the one to lose all your <laughs> yeah. pieces right so so it's, and, and but his point was it, it was a really good so you think like okay here's a chess game that takes the unconscious into account right like it's 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 uh -huh. making failure explicit but his point was and i thought this was so good that that if you do that then the failure becomes a success right then so you can't yes. you can't consciously yeah. or reorient it to, so i think that's the answer to your question like why can't you just why do, why do we even have this illusion of the smooth operation? Well, because the structure of consciousness is such that it can't, it can't, like it turns every f failure into a model of success. It, it, it strives for success and it can't, it, it cannot grasp the, the way that failure is the engine for it. I think that's inherent in consciousness. I, yeah, that's a great answer. It reminds me, um, I may have used this example on the show before, uh, so apologies to some of the audience and no apologies to others of the audience. Um, I think we're, I think you and I are aligned that a cat of the pet kingdom are the, the great theorists. And um, the thing about uh, my cat, as I imagine, is the same as the case for most other cat, uh, pet, pet owners, people who have, who have cats. You buy a, a, a toy for a cat and they want to play with the box and it's like infuriating it's like i thought you were this thing even has catnip in it and you're playing in the box like what like what is that and so it's a i think it's a nice example of what todd just sort of laid out is that like what you could say from a psychoanalytic perspective is ah but the cat sees the object ah. the cat sees it's the limit of the thing that's what is desirable it's the packaging it's not the toy itself but this is the this is this is the reversal. Is if the cat wants the box, then suddenly the toy is the object, uh, is is the object, uh, right? It's it's not it, like like it ha it works in that it, just as just as you said. So uh, with 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 uh, reverse chess, if like winning becomes the the success, 
and failure, failure, but then you reverse it, then it just changes the terms. It doesn't uh, disrupt for consciousness the the way that works. So I think that th this is maybe what I want to what I want to get into is that like I, I don't know is do you do you take do you take fetishistic uh, disavowal to, just to bring go back to the term which the formula for for it um as Slavoj Žižek is is great at pointing out many times is uh, I know very well that fill in the blank but even still I don't believe it or even still I do the opposite whatever whatever it is that's the that's the formula um I, there seems to be an indestructibility of, uh, of that and an imminence to it which is what we're we're talking about this like like you you can you can not like like the the interruption that that you could bring to to consciousness about all this is like is that as far as you can go cuz there's not like like i, I think mm -hmm. To, to go in a, into like sort of like an ego psychology thing where like you're so you should like really be very conscious of your interactions with objects and be very mindful or, or whatever so like what do you uh, what do you what do you think about uh, about all, about all this about this this interaction with the with the object and the psyche and like can can the interruption be our site of inter, of, of interaction with objects or or does or does that just kind of move where the where the smoothness is if you like yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You're so you're basically saying, is it maybe there's something inevitable about the smoothness, right? Like you can't, you can't, mm -hmm. you're, well, certainly you can't get rid of that illusion. I think that's absolutely true. But then mm -hmm. I guess my answer to that would be, it's it's a really, I mean, it's a, I think it's a really hard problem. Um, and I, 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 the only thing I would say is I'm not, is maybe maybe you're asking is fetishistic dal disavowal eternal right like yes is, it, is yep. are we just kind of stuck with that and I, I think in a certain sense yes but i would just say there can isn't there aren't there two different ways of relating to the failure right either you you see the failure as this oh no i i had this interruption of the of the smooth operation next time i'm really going to strive to make it work perfectly or if I get into, I'm just using the Musk and the, who's the other, like yeah, Bezos sure. and all these guys that go into space, right? Like we'll go into space, there things will really be smooth, right? Like there's no gravity, <laughs> right, right, right. it'll really go fine, mm -hmm. right? So, so for them, and I think that, so that's really, I think there's a real tie between the logic of capital and this constant striving for more and more smoothness, right? It, it, mm -hmm. At the same time, capital depends on the interruption of the smoothness to work, but there's this, the engine behind it is this striving for increasing smoothness, uh, at least in the figure of the capital. Um, but I think that there, the other way to relate to it is to see the mm -hmm. failure as the site of, I think this is the way in the wager of psychoanalysis is to see the way, the failure as the site of, of your enjoyment. Right. And I think mm -hmm. use the term from Jacques Lacan, objet a, in case people aren't familiar with that term. And I think, Objet A would be what disrupts the smooth operation, right? So the disruption of the smooth operation is what draws us in. So every time you're on the phone upset or upset that your phone doesn't work, it doesn't recognize me, I forgot my password to something, I got a phishing scam email and I fell for it and I got to reset all my <laughs> bank things and pass. Okay, all that stuff, like all that frustration is itself uh all that stuff is functioning as objet a, right? Like the thing that drives us as desiring beings. The other thing, I think to me that my favorite example of this, and you could think of this as a smooth operation, if in terms of like uh, the looks of the look of someone that you're drawn to, right? If someone looks too perfect, they cease to, and this I think is a smooth operation. They're not, a, they're, there's something radically unappealing about them. Right. I want to use this example. It's, I, it, okay. I, I apologize. It's, it, it's, it's sexist in its orientation, but not in its impulse behind it. So, so my, when I was in sixth grade for my sins, I was sent to a Christian school by my parents because they thought I was okay. obsessed with death or whatever. And, uh, and that made yeah, me that more obsessed with death. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> uh, you probably know this. I've probably told you this many times. Um, but there, there was this, there was a, girl in the class in sixth grade who was just objectively just like perfect she had no flaws perfect skin was perfect. and like no one was interested in her like she was the most popular kid in the class everyone thought she was great but no no male nor female thought of her as a desirable being and i thought 
it's, I didn't, at the time, I wasn't a psychoanalytic thinker, but uh, if I was, I would think like, <laughs> of course, because it's exactly this little slight flaw that you, makes you think like, but for that, I would be, this person would be perfect. That's the thing that draws us in. So like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your partner can say, but for Ryan, if Brian didn't have glasses, he'd be like the perfect looking guy, but that's what makes you the, the acceptable partner. So I think that's oh, really the... Thanks, buddy. I, I, is acceptable too soft of a word? <laughs> the really, really appealing partner. No, I, lo um, I, I love it. I, I think it's a high compliment. Uh, okay, okay. Anyway, so that would be what I would say. That, 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 that there are two different ways of relating to that failure. Like you can embrace it or mm -hmm. you, can, you can think I'm going to surmount it in some way. Mm, no, no, this is, this, I think that's, that's really, really nice. It's not, so it's not sur surmounting. That's, that's, a, that's, that's good. Like, like over, overcoming the, the, uh, you know, to, to, to reach some sort of like plane of perfection. That's perfectly within, uh, capital. I, I mean, I think, I think like what we do, especially since, you know, why are we not here in person? I broke my foot uh two weeks ago and um w making me a, a little bit uh more 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 disabled than usual uh, i have a traumatic brain injury for people who don't know and that is like its own it's like i am a baby i have to take care of every day uh the, the consequences of that but the so for anyone who does have a, a disability listening like like you know like how how often you feel an interruption to the smooth operation of a building of of other people like walking past you, uh, of the way that the the, the capital works, like like the, so like these, uh, so two things on here, um, you become aware that like uh, you know uh, disability is a, is an this is why like critical access studies as a field is like it, it's it's an impediment for the smooth operation of capital that like um, you know buildings that don't want to add a ramp try increasing, increasingly in this country to get historical status for their building so they don't have to become accessible to people. And so that's on the one side. And then on the other side is that like sort of there are basically two cultural narratives, uh, uh, popular narratives about disability, in, at least in this country, is um, that it, at one, it's your superpower. It's the thing that makes you great or it's like you overcome it and both of these are like that's not how it works that's not how having a disability works like like you do, you don't you don't overcome it like you you, you that's why i lose my mind this is a side topic i lose my mind at school a little bit because they make every student who has a documented disability like resubmit it every year or every term and it's like you're not going to suddenly become less disabled. That's not really how that right. works. But anyway, that's right. that's how right. that's how bureaucracy works in in uh, right. in that way. Um, but so to kind of like to smooth out that interruption, you get uh, the the c a compensatory uh, cultural narrative that like tries to make it make you also be make the, the the disabled body also be like a smooth part of of capital. Like you have your place and your place is overcoming that thing. So like I think. Um, what I find really interesting about this topic and where sort of like, I like where we're, we're at in this is that like, can, can there be a sustained, I think this is my question, my, my next question for you. How do we sustain an orientation to failure? That's the, that's the question. Right. We yeah, sustain I, I, an orientation to the interruption. Yeah. 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 I think it's a great question. And I think it's just like, I, I do think that there's a, I don't know that there's like a, a magic answer to that question, but I do think that, that it's a, it, it's a, it, and I think this is the, maybe the ideal of psychoanalytic thought or, or Hegelian thinking, right? Like to change. And I think that's what Hegel means by absolute knowing, right? Like you get to this point where you see Eric mentioned it in the introduction, the, 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 the like he was drawn to, listening to us, whatever, whatever. Um, I find that, I don't know, I'm happy people listen, but I, 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 I can't stand to listen to myself. So it's hard to think about that. But, um, <laughs> but I think that the, uh, I think that the, like the, the drawn to that idea of contradiction, and I think that that's what, that, that's Hegel's idea. Like at, when you get to at the point of absolute knowing, I should say that this is a, not the heterodox reading of Hegel by a lot of people, but anyway, um, that when you get to the position of absolute knowing, you get to this recognition that the contradiction 
is not just this thing that impairs the movement of of thought and being, but the the engine behind it. And so I think that's the like I think it I think it almost requires a d- seeing doubly right. Like so you do, you of course you experience things as a, as a, impairments right as or as as barriers as as limits as problems as they're frustrating right but then Mm -hmm. you have to then at this hold the same idea in your head that this frustration the thing that's frustrating me is actually the thing that's also pushing my desire forward but it's a tough i think it's a tough thing because you know some somebody i was recently on i don't know someone's podcast or something and someone said well aren't there situations where an obstacle is just an obstacle right like it's Mm -hmm. not there's nothing to it that's there's nothing to it that's driving our desire. It just is a bad obstacle that we should get rid of. And the example the person used it was a good example of being in an abusive relationship, right? Like, mm. like I think in a relationship, it's there, like you can think like, oh, there's things that my partner does that annoy me that are tied to the things that I love about that person, right? So that would be, I think, the properly dialectical contradictory sure. way to approach it, right? But but what if that what if that person is abusive to you and, and just, or, or cruel or whatever, like then, then, and you could do that. You could play the same game, but you wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be, then you would want to not do that. Right. Because it would keep you mm-hmm. in an abusive relationship. So I think it's a tough call, right? Like sometimes, sometimes the obstacle or the failure really is just a failure. We should try to get rid of. And I think that's a, mm. I don't know how to adjudicate that. You know, it, theoretically that is, I mean, I think you have to adjudicate it mm-hmm. on a case by case basis. I don't know. What do you think about that? Because I'm I'm really curious about that. Yeah. No. It's interesting. It's a. I mean, it's interesting. Problematic. I think the. Um, I do think. I know that. I know that. Uh, what is it? Um, Freud never literally said the uh, the great one of the great lines attributed to him that a cigar is just a cigar. I mean, but it's a perfectly it's a perfectly psychoanalytic idea. Like I, you know, and a perfectly dialectical idea. I mean, like you just. Um, I guess I, you know, you'd put it this way: like, not everything can be revelatory. If you treat every, if every slip of the, of the tongue, if every misreading, every misseeing is like it explains everything, then that I think that kind of weakens the idea, you, you know. So, um, so what what are the, the the failures that we we move beyond, and how do we know the uh, the the failures to? Uh, like interrogate further because I mean this is what's at stake in contradiction as we like to talk about on the show and you know as Eric was really nice to, to set up when he introduced us that like the, the thing about contradiction is you don't you don't move you don't over- overcome it you don't move beyond it you re- you reconcile yourself to it like it, you you recognize its intractability and I think you're exactly like that's a great example of the abusive relationship like you, you think about that as like that's a I like the word obstacle I don't like contradiction for there because I think contradiction there there is a uh, there's space beyond like or, or or perhaps maybe maybe into would be better whereas with that that the obstacle in that example like you do have to move elsewhere it's such just, a, move just beyond, a, a, right? a different space yeah 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 right right I mean I was and, I, and I, I, yeah. I was in a terrible yeah, God, I was in a terrible relationship, and, okay. and and like I could have, I could have played this little Hegelian. I was even reading Hegel at the time. I could have even done this little Hegelian thing, and no, I don't think I had yet read Hegel. And so there maybe is the problem. <laughs> so but, this but, is there's but, there it is. Yeah, there it is. But self help Hegel. But yeah. You, I, I, so, <laughs> so, so it's funny you said that. Someone once said I should write a self help Hegel book, but I don't think that would be. A bestseller, exactly. But um, I, I, I think that the, I think what you're saying is really good. That 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 you need this. You, but I don't think anything can tell you a priori which it is. Like which, like is mm-hmm. this just an obstacle or is this actually a fecund contradiction? That so, and but I think that, and that's why Hegel writes the books that he writes to say like, look, I'm gonna look at this obstacle, and trace out its logic and say is it just an obstacle or is it actually a contradiction that can and and most of the time he finds that what appear as intractable contradictions are actually just obstacles that we can get beyond in search Mm -hmm. of an intractable contradiction so i think it's interesting Mm -hmm. you can think of it in hegelian in a hegelian light and i think you can also you know like how how, to to what extent is that is there if I trace the logic of this out, is there something in it that's that is going to be 
uh, not just a dead end for me, right? Like, so I think there is. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think I might have something. I might have something for this. Okay. No, okay. Good, good. What do you? All right. Yeah. Okay. You should be excited. Are okay, you excited? I'm excited. I'm You're very properly excited. excited. Yeah. Genu properly. Genuinely. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. So I didn't mean to. Didn't mean to. You know. Yeah. To 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 hype it up too much. So. Okay. Um. What if we What if we need to look at uh, uh Ficta, here? Okay. What if good. We need to look at good. the. What if we need to look at the idea of Anstas? Um, which I, I think um, I'm very happy to say that uh, are we're I think we're the I feel pretty confident Todd that we're the only podcast that endorses Ficta and has I mean we would have been endorsed by the U.S. Embassy in our stay here despite us not doing uh, U.S. promoting U.S. Uh, uh, I, like I that was that was I what knew. everyone worked on at Impact so I feel really happy about that so um, so Anstas what is that what does that mean what is this it th this is a, a word. Um, that is central to, I should say, an idea central to um, Fichte's um, philosophy that gets translated really uh, underwhelmingly into English yeah. as the as the word check. But here's check. what yeah. Fichte, yeah, here's what Fichte is on about: is the obstacle that is also the impetus for something. Right. And I think wonder like if this would be our of finding like the, the interruptions that are worth uh, paying attention to, the obstacles that are worth paying attention to. Is this just an obstacle, as in it is just an obstacle, or is this an obstacle that has a, an intrinsic uh, systemic and structural relation to like a wider field? Is this an obstacle that, is, uh, that, that generates the uh, like, like wider kinds of problems? What do you think about that? No, it's great. It's a great reference. And I think so it comes from Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre, also badly translated as the science of knowledge. Um, but yeah, the, so the, so is the this isn't a word in German, but is the is the is the thing that we're encountering anstoslich, right? Is it is it mm -hmm. like is it is it capable of being a because anstos is a noun, I don't think you can turn it into a an adjective like that, but Todd, uh, we can we but, can do. Yeah, Todd, I think words are just made up. I, I know. Well, Heidegger would do yes. it, right? Heidegger would. Yeah. He would just make a new word out of it. Um, but I think that it's uh, someone who knows German will probably tell me that there really is such a word, but uh, I don't think there is. <laughs> uh, uh, that, but I think it's a, it's a great point. Like if you don't find the impetus within the interruption of the smooth operation, then that's not a that's not a site of contradiction. That's just a site of an obstacle. And I think that distinction is really, really important. I also would say, and I was thinking about this, uh, you know, as we were kind of pondering the conference, the festival theme for, for what we would say, I, I was thinking that it's also the key to believability, right? Like we believe mm -hmm. something's real insofar mm -hmm. as it's, it, it doesn't have a smooth operation to it, right? Like I think that mm -hmm. that's, one reason why the film Blade Runner is so appealing to people because the replicants are they experience like there there's a failure written into their structure right like they can only live three mm -hmm. years like that's part of the I think that's how long it is uh, that that's part of the structure of the the replicant that the failure is part of it so I think that 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 idea that we only believe a thing insofar as it's there's a point of failure attached to it i think is really important that it, it actually it gives that your the, the point at which a thing breaks down or a person breaks down or it gives credibility to the what they are right no it's great i mean like isn't that is this explainable in the cliche true but probably like we you you need you need the other shoe to drop once the other shoe drops you're like ah there it is that's now, yeah, now, go. now I can accept whatever this thing is, this relationship, this, like this piece of, this piece of technology, this like, or, or uh, this, this job or whatever it is. Once the other shoe drops suddenly like, okay, now I'm, now I'm mired in some kind of negativity. I can trust this uh, right, in, in, right. in, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I don't mean to keep talking about relationships, but it's true about relationships, right? Like you, like yeah. when the per person, you just start seeing them, they seem really perfect. You're like, wait a minute, what's, what, are they sure. a serial killer? What's, what's being hidden behind <laughs> that? Right. Like there's also, 
I, I, I love this. I don't, I, I don't know if you got a chance to see it. There's this film called 36 hours and it's with, it's, it's by this guy, George Seaton, who also, he, the, the other films he did, he did this film counterfeit trader, which is a great film about mm-hmm. uh, a guy that uh, it's with William Holden. He gets uh, people out of, out of, uh, Denmark for, uh, during the Holocaust. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and he also did airport. So he did these crazy okay. kind of films, but, but 36 yeah. hours is this film where James Garner, uh, who you pointed out to me is one of the few actors of the sixties. That was both a movie and a television actor at the same yeah. time. Very, no, there was absolute, there was an absolute binary split between that uh, um, until like Clooney, basically, and Clooney, then Clooney right. doesn't so, do TV anymore. So, yeah. could you even say Garner as a hapax? Like he, he's like a, it's a complete one-off. <laughs> yeah, I think explain true. that. That phrase is one of the. That's one of the best phrases. Uh, hapax. Yeah, so a hapax is, is a, a, it's a one-off yeah. basically. So it's it's something that yeah. can only yeah. happen one time, and it only does happen one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, anyway, so back to the long roundabout <laughs> introduction to 36 hours. So We're going to talk about the notebook full... and James Carn- Garner's performance. No, I'm sorry. You, you go. Yeah. That's right. No, or the Rockford Files, right? That's another the Rockford Files, classic. Yeah. Um, or the great, great escape, which is his. The, <laughs> the great escape. Is... Yeah, yeah. This is the, this is the interruption his... in our conversation. I didn't think that's the right, that's in our right. conversation would, would be James Garner. I thought it would have been technology, but please make your okay. point about 36 hours. Anyway, so now here comes my point after all this. So James Garner is a American officer. This is uh, right before D-Day is happening. And the Germans know D-Day is happening. So June 6, 1944. This is like end of May, 1944. And they know it's coming. They don't know where and they don't know when, right? Garner knows where and when. The Germans kidnap him and they hit him on the head and he doesn't know what's happened. He wakes up in a hospital and he's he he thinks it's and they they create this whole sense that it's after the war. The allies have won the war and the Germans have only non only English speaking people with no accent taking care of him and other supposed American soldiers are in the hospital with him. And it's all this elaborate ruse to get him to reveal when d-day when and where d-day would occur and he holds out he'll i mean he doesn't even hold, think he's holding out because he's just it's just he just thinks it's after half and finally he reveals it and what's fascinating so the germans actually have this inside information they could act on it but the gestapo doesn't believe it's real because it came within it did it came within this perfectly smooth operation that went perfectly and because it went mm-hmm. perfectly, the Gestapo is like, wait a minute, we're going to torture him and find out the real truth. So it's an interesting film about torture, too, this idea that torture tells the truth and that you, you, know, you cut someone down to their bare essence and what's revealed is truth. That's a whole, I think that's related, actually, to the smooth operation idea. But the other, the other thing that's fascinating about it is the operation goes too smooth for the Gestapo to believe that it's real. Right. Mm-hmm. So had screwed yeah. up at some point, they would believe it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I love it. I uh I think it's it's great. It's a nice deep cut uh, uh film reference to. Um it's I I don't, I know I cuz I have care uh, uh, my spouse uh, about um if, if she was aware of any mysteries cuz what we're talking about is a perfect crime. And yeah. and uh and we were talking about there's an Agatha Christie uh it's probably a Marple where there is a crime committed and it looks like a um it looks like a suicide perfectly except for one thing which tips off uh that it's a murder but it's actually more perfect than that it's meant to look like it, it was a suicide but it was someone placed something so, sorry it was a murder someone made it look like a suicide to make it look like a murder so that they could find out who really did the murder and it was like two two people uh, each trying to draw and this is i think the most interesting part about it it's two people each trying to draw suspicion on the other because in the matrix of this you know and you mean you know how mysteries work the person you sus- suspect is you should really suspect the least like that's how they that's how they work so like um so it's this kind of, kind of um uh, also like 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 a like a flipping of uh, of of suspicion uh, as well is uh, uh, trying to trying to get at um like Trying to make something work as a as a cover up, uh, per, per, perfectly perfectly smoothly to be able to to catch the uh, the interruption, to be able to catch the onstos, the obstacle that created it, the the, right. the impetus as such. Um, I like that. I like this. I um, I have some 
I have some 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 question here. Maybe this go, going back to the uh, thirty six hours example, and uh, what pushes the uh, we don't have to talk about the film specifically, but maybe structurally, um, this idea that like when something is perfect, like you push it until the point that it fails, and then that lets you know you can accept it. Is this superego? Is this is this presence of superego pushing? like like to, to push on a phenomenon like you have to like you have to test it like the uh velociraptor is testing the fence in jurassic right. park is yeah right. what do you think right. about that is that where the superego is or is right yeah. or is the superego trying to i mean i almost think that the trying to test it and trying to find the point at which it breaks down is in some way the opposite of superego right isn't superego okay. trying to say to us make that operation smooth like mm, it's mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. impulse to say like get this thing working absolutely perfectly and any slight imperfection in it you're you're you you feel this pressure to like get it working perfectly i don't know like i if anyone's ever written a book like you 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 always have a typo in the book right and how about I essay have, can we so, go with essay let's go with okay. essay <laughs> not everyone <laughs> okay 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 if you've written an essay or even if you've written a paper for a whoa 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 if you've written a paper for a, i was so excited um if yeah you've written a paper for a college class or a high school class or anything you've had a typo in it right and so yeah that yeah. It, the existence of the typo i think is a nice like it, it, it like it exposes where the su the superego says get every single error out of it and I mm. think so. I almost think it's the pushing in the other direction. I don't think it's the. I don't think it's the check the smooth operation to make to find the point where it breaks down. I I, I don't okay. know what you think about this, but I would say it's almost the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's the make it smooth because that's inherently unfulfillable, mm. right? Like you can never the super egoic injunction has to be an injunction that you can't obey. This is why the most mm -hmm. the people who feel who always feel the most sinful are the most devoted to the devout right like mm -hmm. they're they feel mm -hmm. that like i'm the worst sinner of all but the people who are the people who are really the most sinful they don't feel you know tony soprano doesn't feel like he's the most sinful right i think mm -hmm. that's the... mm -hmm. no this is this is great and it brings us it brings us back to the uh, to the beginning which is what, what, I, what I what i was hoping for i agree i agree with you i think that like the the superego this is really nice because what we started with with this question is that like okay if we have this hegelian premise right that there would be no such thing as a smooth operation anything that we could consider to be a smooth operation would uh it, it would it would break down at some point right. and and the, the a smooth operation is just a seeming semblance so how does that semblance sustain itself and i think this is interesting to go to superego as the as, as sort of the answer as the as the thing that smooths out you know uh the 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 potential to to see the 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 interruption in 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 the thing so it's the like again it's the it's the flow on the side of the subject right subject, like what right, smooths right. what what smooths out the uh the uh the the, the contradiction so that like they, they don't even they don't even appear so that they appear to go to our language we're developing so that the contradictions appear as obstacles and that they don't they don't appear as 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 contradictions as such. Right. I, I and that's I, such a great point. It's so well put. I think that's absolutely right. That that the that the the point of when you're indebted to the superego, which I think is interesting. This idea of debt and superego, I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. tied together. Which is why we live in the most indebted epoch of all time, and we also I think mm -hmm. live in the most super egoic epoch of all time. So I think there's an absolute link between that. But when you're indebted to the superego, you uh, are constantly trying to smooth out things, but you're always failing. So you keep, you invest more and more and more in it, right? Like the failure doesn't make you, what's fascinating, it doesn't make you stop. But what's fascinating mm -hmm. is that, that you, you, the enjoyment you're getting is from the, the failure, the obstacle, mm -hmm. but you can never grasp it as such because you're so invested in trying to smooth things out with this super egoic dimension. So it's a nice, I think, you can uh, you can lay out the opposition what we were talking about before between like trying to make uh, allowances for one's unconscious desire versus mm -hmm. the super egoic imperative of trying to just absolutely smooth out all operations. So I think that that's mm -hmm. a one way to think of that that kind of opposition. I think I like it. Um, I like it as we like to talk about in. Um... In high school, the you, you know the uh, the way that uh, Freud's uh, tripartite 
uh, structure for the psyche usually gets explained in the um, in the iceberg, you know, uh, uh, yeah. idea and what happens with the uh, with, you know it is underneath and like the the you know superego would would be looming over right and and it, it tends to be be taught of as this like this judgment thing and and the the you know judging on you for for you know not being pious enough but what it's forcing you to do or smooth and enough. this is something or smooth enough yeah what it's smooth. forcing you to do is uh is more there it, it is it is injunction to uh to do more it's like the the really great example of you go on a trip somewhere you always wanted to do it and you you you're left with this feeling that like yeah it was great i just i thought i would have more fun yeah. you know i thought i thought it would be i thought it would be better that's that's super ego that like tr like that you didn't do enough you know that's that, how i felt and, on this trip I, to the netherlands yeah. I felt that way on this trip to the Netherlands. It could, could have just been a little better. Just like thought. your house. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it just yeah, been, know. it's just yeah. a, little, a lot like my Slightly own room. But but could have yeah, been a that's bit that's. A, yeah. <laughs> so is uh, do we think that's that? Do, would you put that? Um, if you're going to try to position the, the terms, do you where is the, who's the driver in this in this of the of the terms to to lay them out? Like so, we we have, we have superego, we have contradiction. We have obstacle. We have onstos. If we were gonna try to kind of lay lay well, them out, like how how do they triangulate? Right. Isn't so. I, I I don't know. This is what I would say. That contradiction is the thing mm -hmm. that's most fundamental, right? So that's the thing that, but but that draws our desire. And contradiction, I think, is he Hegel's translation of fictus anstos, like fictus fictus nice. word that means obstacle and impetus at the same time. So ficta fictus idea was you posit yourself and that's how like you make things matter for yourself and that's how you construct yourself but in order to do that you have to create this fecund barrier fecund limit of the <laughs> anstos the limit that's all the obstacle that's also an impetus and then for hegel he just kind of translates that into a more general idea of contradiction which is what happens when you follow out the logic of any Let's just call it smooth operation, right? So any mm -hmm. smooth operation ends up in a contradiction, and that's the fund. That's the driver, right? That's the thing that drives, and 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 that's what we're drawn to. That's what unconsciously we're drawn to that, and then mm -hmm. we try to obfuscate it. So superego mm -hmm. is the engine leading to the attempted obfuscation, and then fetishistic disavowal is the thing where we hide that any kind of failure or or lack exists at all. So I think that's how all those nice. terms fit together nice. in this, yeah. in this uh, smooth operation uh, way of thinking about things or not smooth operation. Because I think that's, <laughs> I mean, I think that's what was initially fascinating to you and I about this asked when, when Eric asked for us to do this, that, that both of us are pretty convinced of the idea that the, the smooth operation never really is as smooth as it pretends to be, right? Like that it, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it pretends to a smoothness that it doesn't have. And, and yet it looms as an ideal. And yet we're, we're frustrated by the failure of the smoothness. So that, how do you mm -hmm. think all that together? And I think like making the contradiction into the central thing that draws us in is a way to bring mm -hmm. all that together. And also I think Lacan's idea of the objet, ah, this thing that is a, uh, uh, is a failure or is a limit that then that mm -hmm. makes us interested in things. And I think that's the, mm -hmm. what makes us desirous of things. I think is also really important for understanding what's, what's going on with the curse of smooth operations. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Very, 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 very nice. I like that. I like the, 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 the way that, that we worked out J just, uh, for for any for anybody in, in either audience, Todd and I don't work these things up, uh, ahead of time. We have, we're like, if you've ever seen, the way this works, I thought about saying this at the beginning, but I think it's better to say this at the end. Um, okay. If you've ever seen uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, that's basically how Todd and I do the show, where we have some ideas that we go over with, that we know we're going to cover. Um, how we get to some conclusion at the end, that's up to however the conversation takes us. I mean, that's that's why that's why that show is so heavy 
uh just have the as i gotta get to and then whatever jokes come out is like is just the interaction between the actors on set and uh and that's what happens so uh unfortunately not as funny as, as curb i don't think i mean that, that that's aspiration <laughs> we came up way short us. of that yeah way yeah, short way short, way short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but i do think that all these i do think the the ideas work together and i think yeah. um I did. I did have a joke that I just yeah. made up okay. right before. It. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. so here's the joke. It, 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 it ties to our episodes of. We've been doing a series kind of on Alain Badu, the philosopher, and so someone asks, "Was Bad, was Alain Badu present in the May 1968 revolt?" And the person goes, "Eventually." You would think that was funny. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, that was a bomb. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Okay. All right. You did laugh. Okay, good. Because like the other Badu joke, you didn't laugh at all. And I have to say that we got some feedback from our our listeners that said that you lacked a sense of humor. So I just want to, yeah. you know. Clearly. Wanna, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a, anyway, that's, that's a, right. conclu- that's so a conclusion Ryan, to draw. <laughs> what's yes. the lesson for today? <laughs> I think the lesson is 36 hours, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And it's, a, it's the, hard to find. So if you cannot find it, I have a copy, and we'll we'll uh, we transfer it to you if anyone wants it. So yeah. I don't know if I should say uh, that on. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, forget that. I won't do that. <laughs> no, it's not happening. That didn't occur. Okay. What's the, no. No, 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 no? No. Okay. <laughs> no. All right. On to the Q and A. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Hope, Thanks. Hope this was hope this was helpful and interesting. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, one question I have here first is the, the idea of you, uh, about superego there. Like we had this film shown uh, called Good Life uh, two days ago and, or three days ago, was it? Uh, then uh, uh, there is a particular moment in that, in that film when, when the filmmakers themselves start to, to speak about um, uh, this kind of this, this, that the boss has been internalized and and the, the fact that they are themselves always feeling precisely that kind of dis, uh, dissatisfaction with themselves and always something always pushing them that doesn't come from the outside. It's not an exterior boss, but it's, a, it's something inside. And, and then at, later on in the film, there is someone who says, like an entrepreneur that they uh, interview who says, uh, uh, your boss is your app. And that made me think that, uh, like, so they, they have, so, so you have sort of, in that case, then you have sort of, outsourced your super ego to to the phone or to the app and that made me think then could it be that the super ego is somehow always technological uh, does it kind of kind of always come with the uh, does it so that the, the boss was always inside in a certain sense with with a very start at the very inception of technology you know what i'm saying because yeah because yeah I, yeah, Eric, I really like that question. I think that that's uh, like is I think the question is even like is it is the superego at the origin of the technological impulse itself, right? Like that <laughs> I think that's really fascinating because I think that that's probably true because you get this and I think there isn't there a way like, everybody feels this um, burden of like, I don't know, I think of the, uh, my, my, I don't have one, but my spouse has one of these watches that keeps track of all of her biometric data. And on the one hand, everyone's like, okay, that's super egoic. You got this constant self-surveillance. But then what you just said made me think, of it, right? Like, what if the technology is by externalizing this figure of superego, like unburdens us from this internal figure of superego, right? So like there's a kind of way in which we seek the technological superegoic figure so that we like, okay, now, I, I mean, it's like, that's really the, you could even say like, that's the hit, like, that's what Judaism's great contribution to the world is like, the law is made in this external thing. So if you obey that, we don't care what you're doing. So that's, pro, you know, in what your thoughts are. Yeah. So that's then kind of an, a re-externalization of the boss. Is that what you're saying? I think so, right? I think that's what the app does, and I think I, I wonder if that's what the 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 impulse to technology is like to get rid of like it give it gives you some respite from that internal pressure. I don't know, Ryan. Eric, we were talking. Yeah, Eric, we were talking about uh, horror films a little bit before the show, and I think what you said can, is can be described within the horror movie cliche, where the uh, the phone call is always coming from inside the house. 
you know, do you know what I mean mm. when I when, when I say this? It's yeah, it's the it's the um, it's this. It's this out, this this is inside, and we we talk about this um, a, a little bit with the uh, what Lacan has to say about um, these guys. This really nice word, extimate, that we are extimate to ourselves, as in so like like uh, the like a basic premise of psychoanalysis would be that other people see you better than you see yourself, because other people see how you signify, and which you can't. You can try to signify in a certain way, but that does not guarantee it's going to land a certain way to anybody who sees you. Um, and I think that superego works in almost a, a, an, an obverse way, is that it's, it is this, this, seem, this seeming out, outside, the seeming like this force that is, uh, that is external to you, that, is, that has become fiercely in, internal. And, I, and, and then I think with this idea with the, with the technology is that like we... Like my, I take orders from my phone all the time. I think a lot of people do. Like it's like when Do Not Disturb comes on, I'm like, oh, quiet time. Got to be quiet now. That's what I got to do. I have to, I have to power down. And it's like the phone didn't do that to me. I did that to me, and I laundered it through through the phone. So I think that that idea of the, like that the superego, especially through technology, there there is this laundering uh, uh, capacity to it. I think that's what I would add to the idea. Another question I had was, uh, you sort of, you seem to say, you said that there is no frustration, no conscious frustration, the way I get you, in, uh, in uh, smoothness. But I'm, maybe I misunderstood you here, but I'm trying to think that, because you seem to localize the, the, this, uh, the idea that the, the, the error, so to say, the, that we really want something un unsmooth in the, in the unconscious, whereas the uh, drive for smoothness would be localized in the conscious. But can you really make this distinction so clear? Because I'm thinking about there are occasions when this dialectic, so this contradiction really do appear, uh, I think, really, like, that they really coincide, you know? Uh, can you give an example? To consciousness, yeah, so, for instance, this situation here right now, I mean, with you guys being, it's fantastic that you are, we are able to have you here now, but it's also really frustrating that you're not here, you know? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I think that's probably right, Eric. I think that's probably right that that sometimes there are these conscious. I so I would just I would just guard that as a generalization that typically the frustration is conscious and the and the and the enjoyment of it is unconscious. But I think you're right. Like certainly there are times where the frustration is even uh, where where the where the I don't know the the frustration with the smoothness is, but I think the frustrating. I don't I don't know though because I like the thing that's frustrating about us right now is that it's not smooth to you, right? Like that it's not working out exactly right, right? Like the we're not there. We're so I'm I still I'm not sure about. That. I don't know, Ryan. Do you have something on that? I, I think well, I think there's um there's there. I'll, I'll just offer this dialectically is that like you know you and i've been so we, we had a tech check an hour before we started and my whole day uh it takes me because with this broken foot it takes me just no one needs to know this but it takes me a lot to shower i i need i need a lot of help to get into the shower and it's like it's very difficult with a broken foot to do that why can't i take a bath there's no tub in this house so but anyway my whole day has been centered around this thing that we were going to do this thing and i will say this like like uh, emotionally, Eric, like I know that I'm in my room in New Hampshire and Todd is in his in Vermont and you're in Utrecht, everyone listening, but like you, you can't really convince me that we're not in the same place right now. So like that, so, but that, that's like emotionally, like I feel like a, like such a tie to this thing that we're doing. And I think that this is kind of what we're, we're trying to get at is that like, I'm, smoothing this out because if I because I like I keep hearing my cat scratch and she wants so much attention but I cannot leave because I am here with you and I'm and I'm here right now and 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 I, there's a lot of work that uh that I'm doing like you know that I can only be aware of consciously but there's a lot of like unconscious work being done to sort of like smooth this whole situation out delays and all and so I think um that there is so I bring all of this up to say that um, there is something that is uh, intoxicating about the the smoothness. And I think this is what kind of what Todd and I are trying to talk about. Is that like yeah yeah why I, I, yeah Eric I'm, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry sorry for no no go ahead Todd no you, Todd you jump I was in. just gonna say I I, I I don't 
I, I think, Eric, what your question was, was can you consciously experience the smoothness as troubling, right? Like that's the, that's the question. Actually, yeah, or actually the coincidence of both, you know, of satisfaction and dissatisfaction at the same time. It's kind of as if yeah. you, because you, you, we, you know, it's great, great that you're able to broadcast this, to come here to us, but at the same time, I think many would probably subscribe to that idea that it's also, there's also frustration in it. I, I had this feeling very much with, particularly with Zoom when it came, you know, that gave us this opportunity yeah. that's also really dissatisfying. I mean, there's other, other examples you could give, like, for instance, uh, uh, we talked about image technology, me and Florian, in our introduction to the festival, that the fact that, you know, the perfect image that arrived, uh, in a certain sense, like, the, the deep fake, you know, is a, is a, is a good, good example, I think, when you, the image technology works so well, so, so that's really satisfying, but at the same time, it's deeply dissatisfying that the image works so well, so you can't tell reality from, from, from fiction anymore, you know? Yeah, that's good. I, I, you know, when you were speaking, it, you made me think of the, you know, there are these paint, there, there are these works of art now that are created artificially, and and they look, some of them like you're like, well, that's a great painting, right? Like you, and and I remember when I looked at the painting, and I'm like, that's a great painting, made by who can I say made was it was there was no great painter behind the great mm -hmm. painting, and I felt exactly what you just said. Like I'm like, wow. I really, I think that's objectively a great painting, but I'm very disappointed that no one painted it. And I feel like something's really lost if you can just generate a painting that's as good as a, I don't know, it looked like a Bekinski or whatever. Like it looks really good. Uh, uh, Magritte, maybe I don't know what it looked like, but, but I don't know. So you I should just say Dutch, Todd, Todd, say Dutch master. Dutch master. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, that would be too cliche. But I, I, so I think that the, I think that that's, there's an interesting thing. I think you're, but I would just say this, that I think the, that the frustration with it is inexplicable to us. So I think it is unconscious, but I think that's an experience. What we're having there is like that we're confronting our own unconscious. And I think that's what, that's how I would put it, I guess. Cause I don't think the frustration is then immediately it's not, conscious. Then it's not unconscious. What? Then it's not unconscious anymore. No? Well, no, I don't, I don't think that's, I, I guess I would, def I understand why you said that, but I, I would define, like, I think all the time we're, like, the unconscious generates, it, it impacts our consciousness, right? Like, it impacts it, and it makes, it, and it, and it, but we don't know why we're, like, to me, it's unconscious when I, I have an idea, and I don't know why I had that idea, right? Like, that's, there's something unconscious about that. All right, we need to take some, some questions from the audience also. Uh, is there anyone who has a question? Uh, please, uh, we we'll get the microphone here. It's a box. <laughs> uh, hi, I do have a question. I thought it was interesting that you talked about Anstoss and you were sort of stumbling over the German and wondering whether there's some more to it. And the interesting is that in Dutch you have Anstoot and you can turn that into answer geven and answer nemen, so giving and taking. And usually when something is answer geven, it sort of defies public morality. And since your question was, when is something, when does something, uh, an obstacle or a contradiction, you don't really know. So is it when it sort of defies some sort of personal ethics that something becomes aanstoss? What do you think, Todd? I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it, except, I mean, it depends on what you think of ethics, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, you know, like ethics in a psychoanalytic sense, I wouldn't say that. But if it, like, if it defies your personal, like your problems your with ego, that what's that? We have, don't we have problems with, like, Lacan's, the, uh, Lacan's ethical position, like, I, I do think it, it, is one of his like least social ideas, and also the example is not very good. Uh, anyway, sorry, sorry. No, maybe that. Agreed, maybe, agreed. For, I know. So, I agree. Yeah, agreed. yeah. I agree. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that, that like ethics in a sense of whatever, what like a, a. What I, my point was, I think if it, it would have to something is a genuine contradiction, a genuine anstos when it, when it goes against your ego your ideal ego. So that, so in morality in that sense, not, but I think there's a whole other like Kantian morality, 
a whole other kind of morality that that itself is structured against your self-conception. So I would just say it has to cut against your self-conception. So your ego, right? Like that, that would be my answer. I, w I would like it to, just to extend that, Todd. I wonder what you think about this. Is like the I, I like to think of um, just to go back a little bit, Eric. What you're saying about um, some when the 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 unconscious stays unconscious, even if you are aware of it. Sort of like like put it in terms like you can't you maybe can never change your reaction to something, but you can become aware of your reaction to your reaction. Does something occur and you feel, does something happen or you see something and, and your reaction is to be revolted to it? Okay. It causes revulsion. What is my reaction to my becoming, my, my, my revulsion to that? And I think where this sort of idea works with the, the, the question posed, and, and like I, I know I taught it is saying like the, uh, the ethical thing, like where does it cause the, the, the contradiction is that um, where is the unstuff? And the, does, the, the feeling that arise, does it cut against you in some like fundamental, like primary way? Like you want to be seen in a certain way and the phenomena or the thought or the feeling that you are experiencing cuts very deeply against that. And then you have kind of a choice. Are you dismissing it or are you taking stock of your reaction to your reaction? I think that that would be, uh, that, that's how I would answer that question. Well, I don't know what you think of that, Todd. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to that, it's great. Uh, do you have more questions? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you both. Um, I kept thinking about retroactivity, and I'm just thinking if essentially, like this disruption, which ends up or results in this frustration, is essentially this insufficiency of. Uh, the smooth operation in the end. So I don't know what you th would say about that. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, the the question is like, is the is the retroactive is the smooth operation retroactive, or is the yes. disruption of the smooth operation yeah, retroactive? Right. That's like, really nice. and I think that's yeah. a that's a and I think a lot depends on how you answer that question frankly like I think like it would it would, it would change like the way you orient your political being and and, and 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 I guess I would say both things are at work like I think a lot of times it's through retroactivity that it, that the illusion of smoothness is created and then there are other times when and I think this is what Hegel does like I think there are other times when you take a retroactive look at things and then you recognize the way in which there actually was a contradiction in what appeared to be smooth. Like, doesn't this happen all the time? Sorry to keep coming back to relationships, but you break up with someone and then you get, you're at the end of the, and then you look back and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that seemed like it was a smooth operation, but in fact, it was terrible, right? Or like, I, you know, when, when you get your iPhone, I don't, what is the number now? 12, whatever one it is, then you get your 12 and you look 15. back at your 10 and you're like, I thought that 10 was working fine, but it actually wasn't a smooth operation at all, right? Because the new, and so that retroactive, that retroactivity, those aren't exactly great political examples, but that retroactivity lets you see the contradiction. But I think most of the time, it's your retroactivity is ideologically covers it up. That would be, I, 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 I think, retroactive retroactivity ideologically smooths out i think probably most of the time but i do i think the the interruption arising retroactively is a phenomena that is prob possibly the, the entire reason why we're having this conversation so I, I think if it only worked the one way there maybe be nothing to talk about right right i mean I, I, i'm tempted to say that that's the entire political charge of hegel's philosophy right like that idea mm -hmm. that that not treglichite to use the word of that he he doesn't use it for he actually yes. does use it once or twice uh, of re retroactivity like that idea like that you can change something by the way that you read it i think that's pretty important idea uh do we have time for one more question or is it yeah one more question yes um hello so I guess one of the things I've been kind of thinking about is that we've been kind of circling around the theme of embodiment to an extent. 
Um, and kind of this gets me to the question, because I come from more of a phenomenological perspective, so Marlo Ponti, et cetera. So what is it actually that smooths things out? Is it that um, it is capital, or is it kind of these, uh, like, um, super ego? Or is it the body that in itself, in itself tries to continuously smooth things out because everything is just so inherently non-smooth that for us to do anything in the world, we need to inevitably smooth things out. So I guess, um, yeah, especially in the context of crit uh, critical disability studies, um, I think that was a great um, interjection, just kind of thinking about that, like what if the body itself fails us, and who are we even in that context? I don't, so this is, I don't, I think we're, we're probably just at odds on this, so you're going to be very disappointed in this answer, because I think that, that our idea would be, I, I'm going to answer for Ryan, and then he'll tell me how I didn't answer correctly. Nice word. But uh, uh, I think our idea would be that that uh, the body doesn't want to smooth things out, that the body is, con because it's a subject, right? It's never just a body, and so it's got an unconscious attached to it. So it's constantly act trying to screw itself up, right? Like to, to misfire in some way. So, like, can I use your example, Ryan? Of your foot go and ahead. how it happened? Do you mind this? Yeah, the oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Ryan went to the doctor because he just turned 35. And they said his cholesterol is bad. Cholesterol is a little too elevated. And so he said, well, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to go for a run. And so right when he went, the first few steps he took, I think, he broke his foot. Right? So it's a like. This is, this is a, literally true. <laughs> <It's>, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so sorry for I just. No, it's okay. I, if it was it's me, fine. I would have told if it I was know. me too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's a great for me. It's a great example of how he's not just a body; he's a subject, and that subject wants to find ways to not work out correctly. Yeah i I thought that I I, I thought I potentially had. Um, uh, uh, an objection there, Todd, but you, uh, you read my body for filth and I, I have no objection. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so that sorry. has to be the last word, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> good last word. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everybody. Yeah. I hear you talk and, um, yeah, next time in Utrecht. Then. Thanks to everyone. Thanks. Next time in Utrecht. Over and out. <laughs> Over and out. <laughs> All right.